Welcome everyone. Um, I am Lisa Rani. I'm the Director of Research at FERA. And um, if you uh, joined us uh, the previous year, you probably know that since 2020, um, FERA has been organizing this series of webinar called the FERA Flash Talks during the month of May. Um, the month of May is FA Awareness Month, and this year, uh, May 20th, is FERA, uh, FA uh, Awareness Day. And we would like to celebrate this month by bringing you um, every Thursday uh, in May some exciting new research in FA. And we have asked um, junior investigators that are working in FA all over the world um, to share their research with us. Um, we had a little bit of a challenge to them because we are asking them to present their research in just five minutes and one slide and to explain it in very simple terms, in very lay terms. Uh, so um, I encourage you to take this opportunity to, to ask them questions um, and to learn about FA and about them. Um, we will take questions uh, after each talk, and you can type your questions in the Q&A box. Um, at the end of the webinar, um, keep your browser open to vote for the best presentation like we did last the previous years. We'll recognize the most voted presentations with an award. Um, the seminar are the webinars are recorded and you can watch them later on YouTube. So don't worry if you cannot attend all of them. Um, we have two moderators with me today, Trisha and Mike, who will take over in a minute um, and will introduce the speaker, uh, the speakers and uh, uh, take your questions. Um, before we get started, I'd also like to mention that FERA is joining FERA Australia in the Lend Us Some Muscle Global Challenge. Uh, Lend Us Some Muscle is an initiative that encourages everyone to be active during the month of May and help raise awareness for FA. Um, you can request free tattoos. Um, we put the, the web address there on the slide, and Jamie will put it in the chat as well. Um, and you can, you know, put a tattoo on your arm or wherever and take a, a shared a picture of your tattooed muscle on social media. Um, there. Uh, this is the agenda for today. Um, and um, today we're going to learn about the biology of FA. Um, some of the biology of FA, and this session covers uh, some new hypotheses of mechanism that can contribute to the dysfunction, both at the cellular and the tissue level uh, in FA. Um, as you know, we first need to understand the disease to figure out ways to treat it. Um, we need to know um, everything that goes wrong in FA, all the changes that having low frataxin causes to be able to develop treatments and address all the symptoms of FA. Um, so you will hear about some toxic protein produced in the in FA cells, about some changes in the metabolism or special, um, uh, of a special type of fat that makes the, the cell membrane, makes up the cell membrane, um, a presence of leaks in the barium that protects the brain and how to use some a new mouse model to understand the heart pathology in FA. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderators, uh, Trisha and Mike. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember who's going first, but they'll take it from here. Thank you, Liz. My name is Trisha. I am an FA patient. I live with my husband and three children, and I'm a proud member of the FARA Ambassador Group. Our first speaker for the day will be Lisa Romano out of the University of Florida, and she will be telling us, does the GAA repeat expansion produce proteins that can damage cells? Okay. Thank you so much, Trisha, for the introduction. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, <clears throat> Share my screen. Okay. All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Romano. I'm a postdoc in the Ranum Lab here in the Center for Neurogenetic at the University of Florida. And today I'm going to talk about, uh, of course, FA, but for, from a completely different perspective. So get ready. 
So I want to start uh, by introducing some background that everybody uh, knows well. So uh, Frederica Taxa is caused by a repeat expansion mutation in the Frataxin gene, uh, in particular in the intron one. Uh, this uh, GAA TTC expansion mutation is repeated several times and cause uh, Frataxin loss. So what uh, uh, some of you may don't know is that uh, when you have a repeat expansion there is a, in a gene, there is a particular process that can happen. This process is called RAN translation. So now I'm gonna try to explain you what this process is. So in our lab, um, uh, we discovered that when you have a repeat expansion in a gene, uh, this repeat expansion can produce uh, uh, two different uh, RNAs, uh, one in the sense direction and one in the antisense direction. And from these RNAs, uh, uh, several proteins can be produced, up to six, um, three proteins in the sense direction and other three proteins in the antisense direction. So when you think about uh, um, the repeat expansion itself in the gene, you need also to think about the RNA that will be composed by the same type of repeat. And that is really true also for the protein. So those protein that we are gonna call a, a run protein from now on are composed by um, um, a repetition of the same amino acid sequence all over again. So when I start my postdoc here at uh, uh, in, in the Ranum lab, I deeply and intensively uh, study other repeat uh, expansion disorders such as C9 or 72, uh, SCA8, which is another ataxia, and uh, mitonic dystrophy type 2. And what I learn is that those RAN protein uh, have the tendency to aggregate in the cells and in human tissue. They are uh, uh, proteins that are extremely toxic for neuron in particular. And uh, uh, RAN translation and RAN protein can be produced when cells are under stress. So those are the uh, potential RAN protein that can be produced from uh, uh, the GAA and uh, uh, TTC repeat expansion in uh, the frataxin gene. We have polyglutamic acid, polylysine, polyarginine, in the sense direction and polyphenylalanine, polysirine, and polyleucine. So my question when I started this pro uh, pro project uh, was very, very easy. Does uh, run translation happen in FA since uh, FA is a repeat expansion disorder? And uh, to answer that question, I use uh, uh, two different antibody that can target uh, um, polysirine, which is uh, this type of aggregates here, and polyleucine which are possibly the two antisense uh, RAN protein and FAI. So I use this antibody to test uh, some human autopsy tissue. And with uh, uh, a great surprise, we found that uh, uh, in cerebellum uh, human tissue, we can uh, see accumulation of polysirin and the polyleucine in the dentite nuclei and uh, in the, also in the molecular layer of the cerebellum and granular cell layer. So those aggregates, those red uh, huge uh, aggregates uh, are uh, present throughout uh, uh, the cerebellum. And that's true for polysirin and also for polyleucine. So what is important uh, is that um, uh, those protein uh, are present is true in the FA patients, but they are not uh, in FA carriers. So that uh, throw us in a completely new world. And we are trying to understand if uh, the mitochondrial defect uh, that we see uh, at, that is caused by frataxin loss uh, can be a trigger for run translation to happen. So in the next uh, couple of years, or hopefully more, uh, I will be um, trying to untangle this uh, run translation uh, in FA. I want to understand if uh, the mitochondrial defect uh, uh, can trigger run translation. I want to uh, deeply study those uh, uh, run protein, in particular the four missing. And to do that, I'm planning to develop uh, some new antibody to study them better. I want to see if uh, those uh, RAN protein in FA are toxic, especially for neuron and cardiomyocytes. But most importantly, I want to see if the therapeutic approach that we have in place uh, for other repeat expansion disorders, such as C9 or 72 or SCA8, 
are uh, therapeutic approach that we can possibly use uh, to treat uh, FA. So with that, I conclude my uh, talk. And I want to thank, uh, of course, Safara uh, to uh, give me the opportunity to uh, carry on uh, this uh, fantastic project that I'm very passionate about. And also, of course, my uh, mentor, uh, Laura Ranum, which is very, very supportive of me and this uh, fantastic project. And of course, I thank you all and I'm happy to take any question. We have one question. So if anybody else has a question, please throw it in the Q&A section. The one question for you is, when you refer to stress, what kind of stress are you talking about? Okay, so what we know, especially from, uh, uh, well, I study uh, really, really uh, intensively C9. Uh, I'm talking about uh, ER stress. Uh, which is uh, one of the stress that can cause uh, run, uh, protein accumulation. But also, I well, I have some evidence of uh, mitochondrial stress that can be involved uh, in uh, run protein accumulation. Because by treating with H2O2, which is um, um, an oxidative stress, or I can see an increase of run protein in uh, C9 or 72 uh, in that context. But generally... Potentially, every type of stress can be a trigger uh, uh, for uh, run translation to happen, really. So we are studying um, deeply those things. Any other? There is one more question. Do I have time, Liz? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. I think, you know, I have several questions. Okay, the, um, the next question is, how long did this study last? So, sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? How long did the study last? Uh, this study, I, I did uh, start working on, on FA in August. So it's a, a really new, brand new project. Uh, that I'm planning to, to work on uh, uh, in the next uh, few years. And hopefully, um, if I will continue in the academic uh, world, maybe for longer. There, there are also a few questions in the q and I don't know if you see them, Tricia, yeah. but uh, one is about studying phenomenon uh, poly phi. You study polyserine and polyleucine. Well, yeah, we study polycerin and polyleucine because we um, produce the antibody for other uh, ataxias, and uh, those other ataxia accumulate polycerin and polyleucine. And this is why we have uh, so many information about these two RAN protein that are very toxic. Uh, so I'm right now developing a new antibody to target every single one of them and to study them better. And uh, uh, I have to say that the Polyphenylalanine is the most, uh, well, to produce the antibody for it uh, is very difficult. Uh, so what I am doing is to try to study that in an, uh, you know, overexpression and in vitro kind of uh, model uh, right now because I don't have uh, uh, yet uh, antibody available. But I predict, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, that this is going to be a very nasty protein to, to work with. <laughs> You see the the other two. There's another one about how if longer repeats uh, lead to lo larger amount of products of uh, rent translation. Uh, well, the longer the repeat, the longer uh, the uh, the amino acid uh, sequence will be. So potentially you have uh, uh, bigger aggregates, for example. Uh, but yeah, we we see some correlation with the repeat length. Uh, but I cannot really uh, speculate that on on FA because it's like a work in progress and just uh, started. But it's definitely something that I will look uh, into and try to see if there is a correlation between the repeat length and the you know how how toxic uh, how bad those proteins are.
And there's one last one. Yep. Have you definitely concluded that RAN proteins have not accumulated in carrier tissue? Okay, so uh, that's a very great question. So right now, I'm uh, I did the screen uh, uh, six uh, FA patients and two uh, carrier, which are uh, um, they don't have any polyserin and polyleucine aggregates. Um, I definitely have to to look uh, into all the other RAM protein really. And we are trying to collect uh, some more sample uh, for the FA carrier in order for me to add more uh, into the um, cohort that I already analyzed. But by now, uh, the carrier that I analyze, uh, they are not uh, accumulating any of the polyleucine, uh, polyleucine and polyserine um, RAM protein. And I did conclude that by, by, by IHC and uh, using these two antibody. And there is another question, Lisa. For the GAA repeats, have you studied interruptions of the repeats and the effect on the protein? That's a fantastic question. And this is something that I will definitely dig into it uh, because, uh, you know, we, we know from other diseases that interruption can, uh, uh, you know, modulate uh, this uh, type of protein. So we would like to, to see if interruption makes things worse. Um, yeah, it's definitely something that we're going to look into it, but we didn't yet. Yeah, it's a project that just uh, started uh, last uh, August. So you need to wait. <laughs> I don't see any other questions at this time. So thank you very thank much you so for much. your presentation. If anybody does have any further questions, you can drop them in the Q&A and we will come back to them. Thank you. I'll uh, stop uh, sharing my screen. Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce Mike Anderson, who will introduce the next presentation. Hi, all. Uh, I'm a parent of two sons with FA and a retired neuroscientist. So for whatever that's worth. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Our next talk is by Zanushka Ramchurer from uh, Brunei University in London, so very far away. Uh, welcome. And uh, she's gonna speak on the role of sphingolipids in FA. So, so for those of you who don't know much about sphingolipids, they're in essence fat molecules of a certain type. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for the, for the introduction. I'll just share my, share my screen. Uh, like Mike said, I'm Zanushka. I'm a second year PhD student at Brunel University London in the United Kingdom. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the research that I'm working on for my PhD project, which is the role of sphingolipids or a certain kind of fat in FA and if we can target this for the disease. So I'll start off by explaining a little bit what happens in FA. So as you heard um, from the last speaker, uh, Frederick's ataxia is characterized by a GA repeat expansion in the FXN gene. And what happens is when we have this mutation, we have a reduction in the level of the protein for taxin. When we have reduced levels of the protein for taxin, this has an impact on the mitochondria. If without this frataxin protein, the mitochondria cannot have the activity that it needs to have, and it also leads to iron toxicity, leading to increases in oxidative stress and eventually cell death. This leads to symptoms such as difficulties in walking, cardiomyopathy, and skeletal deformities. Sometimes patients can become wheelchair bound and have a shortened lifespan. So it's really important for us to look at all the different avenues in FA and see how can we can treat it. So what I'm doing is looking at the role of sphingolipids or fats, which have been investigated in other neurodegenerative disorders, such as Alzheimer's and in Parkinson's, and seeing if this can have an effect in FA. So what are sphingolipids? So sphingolipids are a kind of fat that you can find in your cell membrane. And these are involved in controlling the levels of cell growth and the levels of cell death. So what we have is a cascade of reactions which leads to the formation of a fat called ceramide. Ceramide can then be converted by these things called enzymes 
into different fats, which can control cell growth or cell death. So ceramide and sphingosine are fats which control cell death, whilst sphingosine 1-phosphate and ceramide 1-phosphate, or S1P and C1P for short, are involved in promoting cell growth. So what I'm doing for my project is looking at targeting the different enzymes involved in forming these fats and seeing if they have any improvements in FA. So in the Ataxia Research Lab at Brunel University London, we have two different kinds of models. The first are in vitro cell lines derived from patients of FA, and the other is an FA mouse model. We have YG8J and YG8 extra large, which have over 800 GAA repeats. So the first thing to look at was to see if there were, in fact, any differences in the levels of these fats. And what we found is that there's a reduced level of S1P, which is involved in promoting cell growth, and an increased level in ceramide, which is involved in promoting cell death. So then what I did was have a look at which enzymes actually control the levels of ceramide and S1P so that I can then investigate these. So SPHK is involved in promoting S1P and LPP is involved in promoting ceramide levels. So the next step was to look and see, are there any changes in this? And so what I did is I looked at the gene expression and protein expression, but I've shown gene expression here but they showed the same trend in that there is a reduced level of SPHK and an increased level of LPP. I also then confirmed what I found in the cell lines in the FA mouse models and found an increase in LPP protein expression and a decrease in SPHK protein expression. So following on from this, the next step was to target this to see if we can increase the activity of SPHK and decrease the activity of LPP and see what effect this had. So by activating SPHK and improving its activity, I've actually found that there are increases in FXN gene expression following this. Furthermore, after reducing the gene expression level of LPP, I found an increase in the SPHK level at the gene expression level, as well as increases in FXN gene expression. So now that I found a difference in the levels of the sphingolipids and that in fact targeting these enzymes had an effect on FXN, it was important to look and see, are there any changes in the mitochondrial dysfunction that we have in FA? And so looking at the mitochondrial reactive oxygen species, as well as the activity through mitochondrial membrane potential, I found that by targeting these enzymes, we can reduce the levels of this reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria, as well as improve the mitochondrial membrane potential. So i.e. giving some sort of indicator of mitochondrial activity in FA cell lines as well. So having seen these improvements, I hypothesized that these targets could potentially have an effect on other mitochondrial dysregulation found in FA and potentially could have an effect on frataxin protein expression. And this is really important for going forward because it outlines a different mechanism by which FA could be happening inside the body. I'd like to take this moment to say thank you to Farah for giving me the opportunity to give this talk, as well as everybody in the Ataxia Research Lab at Brunel for all of their support. And thank you to you as well for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for uh, a very nice presentation, uh, way over my head. Uh, I guess one question I have is, is uh, are these sphingolipids uh, affected by um, reactive oxygen species that we know are, are a part of the, the sequelae that uh, FA patients go through? Yes, so it has been shown in, not in fibroblasts or in FA in particular, but in other cell types, that reactive oxygen species can trigger the levels of ceramide and vice versa. So it's not quite clear which of these happens first, if reactive oxygen species is triggering ceramide or if ceramide is triggering reactive oxygen species, but we know that there is some interaction between them. And are, are, are these sphingolipids sort of uniformly present in brain and heart and, you know, throughout, after all, every living cell has a membrane. Yeah. So is so there any are... differential? So the ones I'm looking at specifically, they are very much abundant in the mitochondria. So you are going to find them in those cell types, like in those tissues, like you mentioned, like the brain, the cerebellum, the heart, those um, tissues which very much rely on the mitochondria, you do find those in there. They can also be localized to other parts of the cell, such as the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus as well. 
but it is more or less uniform in those sort of places where you get the mitochondria. So we have a question from the audience. Uh, you show a decreased expression level of sphingosine and an increase in ceramide. Uh, however, the decrease and the increase are within the error bars. Therefore, my question to you is, do you feel that expression change is real? Mm. Which is always a question in yeah. research or, or anything. Yeah. So some of the disparities that we find when we do our experiments can come down to the level of the GA repeat expansion. So because of the cell lines that we have, some of the cell lines have maybe 300 GA repeats, other cell lines have 700 to 800 GA repeats. And it has been shown in literature that the greater the length of the GA repeat, the greater the impact this is on transcription and the reduced levels of photaxin and further down um, downstream effects of the of the disease. So a lot of these um, uh, issues that we have in terms of variability comes from that GA repeat expansion, but the general trend is the same. Do you have access to other other cell types from from the patient population? Uh, cheek cells or you know something beyond fibroblasts so the reason that we use fibroblasts are typically because they are easier to grow in mm -hmm. in the lab they grow quite well and also a lot of research done within when within fa uses fibroblasts because they've been established that you can buy them quite easily from the coriol institute and obtain them so that's one of the reasons why we use the fibroblast cell lines Currently, we don't have any other cell types, but this is one of the reasons why we use the FA mouse models and take tissues from them to see if there are any changes in those tissues and that are highly affected in FA. But it's a, it's a good point and it would be good to look at some other cell types as well. I have a, like a general question of, mm -hmm. do you think these changes that you see can is are a good way to measure how this disease progresses over time? Are, are you see changes, for example, in the mouse? You know, do they get worse? Yeah, I think it, I think it's a good way. One of the aims that I have when I reach the final year of my PhD, so in around October, November time of this year, is to have a look with these mouse models and do things like rotor rod tests, hang wire tests, grip strength tests, and see if there are any effects over time with the mouse models, as well as doing some dose studies as well with these with these drugs and seeing if there is any effect on the ability to walk, the, the grip strength, and afterwards taking those tissues and again, evaluating the gene expression and protein expression and seeing if there's any change there. You've obviously given a lot of thought to this aspect, which is a fairly new aspect for FA research. Uh, do you have any ideas about how this could be therapeutically useful? Um, I think if we are able to proceed to um, like mouse model studies and see if there are any improvements in the ability of walking or in the strength of these mice, if these drugs could then be further put into clinical trials, let's say after animal studies, there could be a therapeutic effect there, particularly looking at the fact that there has been some improvements in gene expression level. If there is shown to be an improvement at the protein expression level as well, this potentially could have an effect in the mitochondria in reducing that iron toxicity and that oxidative stress, rather than just targeting the antioxidant effect, which is what some treatments in clinical trials are doing now and how omavaloxalone works as well. Are there any que other questions from the audience? So there, there is one in the q and So the question is how many individual take part of the study, but so maybe, you know, um, we can uh, ask, is the, the, are the fibroblasts from one uh, individual for multiple individuals and do they you know d do you see them in, in all of them in all the different lines if they ha you have multiple lines yeah so these are uh, different patients so each 
repeat that I do is with a different patient cell line. So I will have at least three different uh, healthy individual cell lines and at least three FRDA, um, FA uh, individual cell lines as, as well. I can't remember what the other part of the question was, sorry. That, that was that was it. Yeah, if, oh, okay. if you have multiple lines, the, yeah. the, your fibroblast line come from multiple uh, yeah. donors. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're multiple patients. So in the Ataxia Research Lab, we have around eight different ones, about eight healthy ones, eight FA ones, and we try to use as many as possible in in the studies. Our next presenter is Francis Smith of the State um, University of New York at Buffalo. And the title of her presentation is, Is Your Brain Zipper Down? Thank you, Trisha, for the introduction. Let me get started here. Okay, so thank you so much, Trisha, for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Frances Smith, and I work in the Daniel J. Osman Lab, and we are at the University of Buffalo in New York. And uh, this is us over here in the lab. Uh, you might not know us very well yet. We are pretty new to the FA community. We've only started researching in FA in the past couple of years, but we have found that it's a very excellent community to be a part of, so we're happy to be here. Um, everything that I'm going to talk about today has been in the development of my uh, PhD, uh, degree here at Buffalo, and I'm going to be asking you uh, for the FA brain, is your brain zipper down? And hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll know what I mean by that. So instead of what we would normally think of in an FA talk, talking about the brain, I'm not going to be talking about the whole brain, but instead I'm going to be talking about the uh, blood vessels which sit right on top of the brain. And this is often also called the blood brain barrier. And if we zoom in, molecularly what this looks like. The blood-brain barrier is exactly what it sounds like. It's a layer of cells that physically separates the blood from the brain, and it has a very important job. So the blood-brain barrier has to provide nutrients that travel through the blood, such as oxygen and sugars, um, so that the brain cells can get these nutrients. But it also has to make sure that there aren't uh, any toxins or any germs coming from the blood into the brain. And the reason that the blood-brain barrier is so good at this is because of two uh, architectures, cellular architectures that I'm going to talk about. So the first one we can think of like they are the teeth of a zipper. So these are proteins which sit at the edge of neighboring cells in this blood vessel here. And they make it so that the, uh, the neighboring cells can be zipped up tight. The second structure that's important to this is um, proteins that sit underneath the zipper and they're kind of like Lego bricks. So a single Lego brick doesn't offer very much structure, but when the Lego bricks are attached up in a nice wall, they can really give a strong structure. And so both of these two different cell architectures the zipper teeth protein and the Lego block wall are important in making so that the blood-brain barrier can do its job of making sure that the right molecules enter the brain and no bad molecules enter the brain. And so for a little bit of background information, it's been found in Parkinson's disease patients that bad zipping between these cells can cause damage to the brain cells that sit underneath these blood vessels. And the reason that we need to protect these brain cells, um, also called neurons, is because these cells are very, very sensitive to any kind of damage. And so the hypothesis for my doctoral thesis has been that bad zipping might be causing a toxic brain environment in FA as well. I'm going to talk about three results that I've found so far. The first is that in my FA model of these uh, blood-brain barrier cells, we lose some of the zipper teeth between the individual cells. And if you've ever had a jacket with a broken zipper, you know that then the zipper isn't very functional. Secondly, I've found that my Lego brick wall 
is disrupted. And not only is it disrupted, but there are some proteins that prevent those Lego bricks from lining up very well. And finally, I found that these changes come along with the ability for molecules, small molecules, to move between these cells. And remember, we don't want that to happen because the cells that we're supposed to be protecting are the brain neurons, and they're very vulnerable to stress. So uh, in total, what I found is that we have changes in those two architectural parts of the cell that I talked about. We have less liberative protein, and we can't form a nice uh, structured brick wall beneath us. And so what does this mean for the future of FA research? There are some medicines that can help the cells make more zipper teeth proteins. And so what I'll be answering in the next part of my research and further on in my career is if these medicines, by improving the zipper teeth, can help the environment of the FA patient brain. So finally, I would like to thank the American Heart Association for um, supporting my project for the final two years of my PhD program, for FARA for the invitation to speak today, and for uh, all of the listeners. So I thank you all, and I'm happy to take any questions. There is a question. What are the zipper tube proteins and the Lego block proteins called? The zipper teeth proteins, there are two zipper teeth proteins. Um, uh, one of them is called clodin, and the second one is called occludin. And um, they are actually stuck to the Lego proteins by a third protein called ZO1 or ZO2. Um, and the Lego block proteins are called actin. So um, these are part of what we call the cytoskeleton. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is a structural skeleton that sits uh, in the cell to make sure that the cell has the right kind of structures. And have you begun any work to find what molecules might support the barrier? and keep it more structurally sound. That's uh, what I'm moving on into right now when I'm looking at some of these uh, medicines to see if we can help support the structure of the zipper teeth protein. Um, there are some therapies to help support the structure of the Lego brick proteins, but it gets a little bit um, complicated because uh, kind of targeting this pathway might end up changing some other parts of the cell in terms of um, uh, what we call the redox potential. So if there are any uh, oxidative stressors, it starts to get a little bit complicated when we try to change um, the Lego brick wall problem. But the zipper teeth uh, problem, um, hopefully, uh, can be um, an easy fix. Liz, would you like to interpret the next question? Sure, I think it is asking if maybe the if there's a really this um, this leak in the blood brain wouldn't that cause a, a bigger effect in FA? Um, it depends. Uh, there are a couple different kinds of leaks. Um, what we know of as a stroke is a big leak in the blood vessels. Um, but there are blood vessels of all different sizes in the brain. So we can see up in my picture as well, there are some really thick, uh, big blood vessels and they, they can be smaller. Um, so the smaller blood vessels would be, for instance, microcapillaries. And if we have a small leak in those microcapillaries, it's very hard to detect. Um, so it, it can be a spectrum. I'm more curious about how, how did you get to this idea? Why did you 
do you, you know um did you have any indication or any um that that this was an issue in FA or how did you get to the idea to study the um, blood bar barrier? <laughs> That's a good question. It was a lot of faith uh, and speculation. Um, we actually are a blood brain barrier lab. We are not a free risk ataxia lab. So we didn't have any access to patient MRIs um, or any kind of patient brain samples to look at you know, the possibility for any leaks. But what's always been striking to me is the presence of brain iron accumulation in disease, um, which there's a little bit of literature showing that the brain iron accumulation happens throughout the entirety of disease um, versus the, uh, the times of disease where the brain cells are dying. That's really early. So I was kind of interested to know uh, why this brain iron accumulation is happening continually, and could it be coming from if there are any leaks in the blood-brain barrier? Because of course, iron is very present in the blood. Um, so if we get any kind of microbleeds, like I talked about, um, that might be a reason that we're seeing that brain iron accumulation, and that led to this whole hypothesis. Is is there any evidence that that these Defects are in one part of the brain and not another. In other no. words, these are, <laughs> these are endothelial cells by and large, I assume. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, the other ramification, of course, is that one of the difficulties with drug therapy in the nervous system for uh, FA patients is that a lot of the drugs don't pass the blood brain barrier. So, you know, find, finding this out and whether it is differentially an issue could be uh, of great impact on drug access and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Um, from what I know about other types of ataxias, um, Mercado Joseph's disease also has um, blood brain barrier breakdown. Um, whether uh, that is regional, you know, specific to one area of the brain or not, um, I'm unsure. That is something that I would. Uh, like to understand because as we know, the FA brain itself is affected differentially in disease. You know, the cerebellum is really affected versus parts of the cerebrum are less packed. So um, that is certainly, you know, an interesting route to take. And uh, like we said earlier, um, until we have therapies and cures, I think that the best way to approach these pathologies of FA is to not leave any stone unturned, you know, and really try to look um, at all of the pathologies that we can to try to find some therapeutic potentials. Well, thank you, Francis. I think we probably should move on to the to the final contribution in this hour, and it's coming to us from uh, Tyler Perfit. And he's from Pfizer, and it's going to be quite a shift from what we have been talking about because now he's going to talk about uh, cardiac uh, potential problems and uh, the use of mouse models, uh, in particular in heart failure in an FA model. Um, Tyler? All right. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. Go ahead and pull up my slide. All right, so as Mike mentioned, this is less of a research project and more a new tool that we hope that uh, other researchers in the FA community will be able to utilize. So us, as well as plenty other of research, utilize mouse models in order to study disease uh, in a living animal, as well as to potentially uh, test therapeutics on. There are a number of different mouse models for FA. Um, many replicate the entire disease as it occur occurs in human patients, but there are also uh, specific models that only affect different parts of the body. For FA, there are a number of different models that only remove protaxin from the heart of mice while keeping it present in the rest of the body. This still generates a lot of symptoms 
um, such as heart failure in these mice models, um, which allow for researchers to really focus in on key symptoms of FA. Now in the field, there is uh, a commonly used mouse model called the MCK for taxon mouse model that I've got pictured here in red on the slide. Now, this is widely used, um, but we have generated what we're calling the new MCK for taxon model that's gonna be pictured here in blue. And we uh, generated this model because we hope to overcome some of the disadvantages of the old MCK model, um, which the main disadvantage is that this mouse model is a very severe form of the disease. So here on the right, I have a graph that is actually um, echocardiographic data, um, which is an important indication that's used in human patients, but I've relabeled it to uh, hopefully make the point that your heart health can be very good, or it can be very bad in um, unaffected individuals as well as uh, FA patients. Now here in red, you can see the old MCK for taxon model begins to show symptoms as early as five to six weeks old, which is very young for mice. This progresses over the next couple of weeks um, with an increased heart size, cardiac hypertrophy, which eventually does lead to heart failure. And these animals are no longer able to survive after around nine to 10 weeks of age. Now, while this is good in the sense that you can get studies uh, finished quickly in that short amount of time, it does pose a problem in that you have a very short window in order to look at the disease as well as uh, test potential therapies especially if you're trying to prevent the, uh, the disease from even occurring in the first place. With our new mouse model, the new MCK, we've got that pictured here in blue. You can see that um, up until nine weeks of age, which is when the old model would begin to pass away, um, our model, as far as we can tell, is basically indistinguishable from a uh, unaffected mouse, even though it doesn't have any frataxin expression in the heart. Instead, what we get is starting at around 13 weeks of age and going to around 18, 19 weeks of age in these animals, we begin to see um, symptoms pop up, but they occur uh, in a much slower fashion. And they still do eventually reach the same severity that we see with the old MCK mouse model but it takes a lot longer and it occurs much slower, which is uh, useful for a mouse model. It allows these animals to live longer into adulthood. It allows researchers more time to test therapies and to see if they can uh, reverse these changes that aren't occurring so dramatically. And so our hope is that you know, this new model will be able to put out into the FA field and that it will be able to help researchers who are looking at uh, correcting the heart symptoms that occur in FA in order to hopefully find new therapies. And with that, I'd like to you know, thank everyone here at Pfizer who's been a part of this project, um, everyone at FARA for the opportunity to speak and uh, to the audience for listening in. All right, we have a question, and it is, was cardiac function assessed between the old and the new MCK mice? Was there any echocardiogram studies to look at hypertrophy or cardiomyopathy progression? Yes, so we've been able to uh, perform both of those studies, not simultaneously, but we've been able to um, perform them separately on the old and the new mice. And uh, as I mentioned before, the progression is a little bit slower in the newer mice, but they still do reach the same level of severity in terms of uh, echocardiographic output. There's a follow-up question here, or another question here. What explains the difference in the timing of the phenotype onset and decline? 
Do you have any insight in that? Yeah. So, um, you know, I won't dive too deep into the genetics, um, but what we can say is that our new mouse model initially does have um, a little bit more frataxin being expressed than the old model, not um, anything that would be above the expression of a wild type animal or an unaffected animal. This model just seems to take longer to really remove all the frataxin from the heart. And we have uh, another one. Uh, first uh, evaluation, what great work. Are you finding a demand for your new mouse, uh, cardiac mouse model? And I'm wondering how interested the research community is in cardiac research specifically. Well, so this is the first uh, public disclosure of this mouse model actu actually. So, you know, we are hoping that in the future when this research is published um, that the field will be able to have access to the mouse and to um, incorporate it into their research. Uh, and there is a fair amount of interest in the cardiac aspects of FA. Um, heart failure or any sort of arrhythmia, you know, is a, is a very uh, devastating cause of mortality in FA patients. And, you know, that's reason in and of itself for FA researchers to focus on the heart. Um, so this slower development, is it, uh, is it a dilation kind of uh, beginning to failure? In other words, do you see early on, you know, 14 weeks or so, do you see that the, the heart is gradually dilating and thinning? Or you know, what, are the, what does that look like in the mouse? Yeah, so at the earlier time points, um, you know, especially at the nine week or so time point, the hearts are indistinguishable from an, a wild type or unaffected mouse heart. As this progresses, we do start to see a shift towards um, hypertrophy. We have um, increased heart size, increased size of the left ventricle. Um, and we do also see um, some changes in the dilation of the heart. Um, not able to go too much into that at this point, don't wanna get you know too stuck in the weeds, but yeah, we do see a little bit of dilated cardiomyopathy. So I guess, would you say that this, this mouse model is gonna give you insights into what clinicians should be looking for in their patients? Because that's always a, a difficult call uh, in in many patients where they're compensating, but and their heart is good is managing okay, but the question is who's going to turn the corner to to really nasty potentially fatal failure? Is there any insight there from from this new model? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we have only done you know kind of the initial work on this model, just looking at um, the couple of time points that you see on here. A next step would definitely be going into some more of those, you know, in between time points when we start to see a phenotype arise to see if there's anything specific that we might be able to pull out that could give an indication to clinicians when, when our animal goes from not having a phenotype to having a phenotype to see if that could be translatable to patients. So there's a question from the audience. Could cardiomyopathy be detected in the early stages uh, always be found in echo? In other words, is echo sensitive enough or is there another, another uh, technique that would, would actually give you better insight than simply echo? I realize echo is easier to do, but are there other things that you can try? Uh, that's a great question. Um... So for us in this initial characterization, we haven't looked at anything more sensitive than echo. We have been able to look at some of these time points at the um, actual heart of the animals by weighing them 
and getting the actual heart mass relative to unaffected animals um, and don't see a gross change there. But yeah, doing a, using some more advanced techniques, we could maybe see something at these earlier time points, um, but that's something we haven't done yet. For anybody who's not worked on a mouse, mouse cardiac work because of the size of the chambers and so forth, even echo is very challenging uh, compared to humans and so forth. So uh, here's, an, here's another uh, question in the old MCK for taxon research model, researchers were able to reverse the damage of the heart. Will the new uh, the new model be also be able to show this response? Have you get, gotten into treatment yet? Um, so we haven't done anything. I haven't done anything in terms of treatment with the new model, but that is definitely you know the next step that we're looking to um, you know take this mouse model, both you know potential treatments that have already been published, um, whether that be gene therapy or, you know, any sort of small molecule studies as well. All right. I don't think we have any other questions. Um, yep. I, I would like personally make a statement. I have, I have, I have, uh, uh, overseen presentations like this, it's extremely challenging to present, particularly to a lay audience, but in such a short, you know, 15 minute segment. And all of you have done a very nice job of, of giving the essence of what you're doing. And obviously, it's only a small piece of all the efforts that you're, uh, you're expending. So thanks, thanks to all of you uh, and, and your support and hope for continued success. I absolutely agree, Mike. Um, everybody did a fantastic job. This was a great, great uh, first start uh, for this series of webinars. And so thank you all you guys for, for speaking and for presenting your data. Thank you so much, Trisha and Mike for moderating. You did a wonderful job as well. Um, I just wanna remind everybody that the next session is May 11. Uh, this will be at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, we'll hear how cell and mouse models are used to study FA. You've heard a little bit today. We'll, heard, we'll hear more next, uh, next time. And also about some clinical research on diabetes. Um, when you log off, don't close the browser right away. Um, you'll be prompted to vote. So vote for, their favorite, for your favorite presentation today. And see you, everybody, next week.